Thanks for bearing with me on this Monday morning, already a challenging day. Happy Monday to all of you. Um, it's really great to be here um, with the GSMI team, and I hope you're having a great day so far. I'm so excited to kick off Talent Acquisition Week. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Lamont. I am the founder and CEO of Exactio. Um, I've been in the employment brand and uh, talent acquisition and HR space for almost 25 years, um, which doesn't make me old, but it does make me have a lot of opportunity to share not just what I've learned, but to learn from all of you. So I'll be keeping an eye on the chat as we go. I've shared my um, information. So please feel free to reach out if you've got any questions and we'll make sure to finish early enough that um, we can answer questions today as well. A couple things before we get started, because my job is to help you set your mindset for the rest of this week. Um, I wanna share a couple things. One is I'm not an economist. I'm also not a politician. What I'm really here to do for all of you this morning is to help you consider what has really happened to talent acquisition over the past 18 months? What does it mean for us? What is the data telling us, both qualitative and quantitative? And what can you actually do as a talent acquisition leader? So let's start with a little bit of a flashback. In February of 2020, we were kind of swimming along. Unemployment was pretty good. Um, we had added some jobs, you know, in the same piece of growth as we had in January of 2020. Um, we had a good percentage of the population that was working or actively looking for work. And we had a, you know, a chunk of people certainly that voluntarily left their jobs. That's what causes that churn, that labor market. And we think about work from home, only about 8.2% of Americans actually work from home. I was one of them. Um, prior to COVID, Exactio was a 100% virtual organization. I've worked um, virtually for almost 10 years. So it's been really interesting to see this COVID shift. That's where we were. Let's talk a little bit about where we are now. It's imp really important to know the data is literally changing by the second. So this is a snapshot in time for you all of current state, which may change tomorrow. It may change next week. Um, the data that you see here is mostly from BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And to give you a snapshot, it's important to start with what we know is factually true. As I said, I'm not a politician. I'm not here to posit one way or the other which numbers are necessarily more important for your organization. I always feel like our job as talent acquisition leaders is to make sure we know how to access the data. We know where it is. And then we really stop and think, what does this mean for me? So I start with the Bureau of Labor Statistics because governmentally, that's who tracks data here in the US. Now I will pause and say most of the data I'm going to share today are United States based or American based data points, but the themes are really similar globally. So if we look at where we are right now, um, from an unemployment perspective, we're about 2.5% greater than pre-pandemic numbers. Certainly nowhere near the high we were at during the height of COVID. We've added a lot of jobs, which normally is always seen as a really good thing. Um, but the jobs that were added in June of 2021 were most being mostly in hospitality and service, which as we're starting to hear qualitatively or anecdotally, those are industries that people are starting to question if that's really a place for them. You'll see from a labor market participation rate, where it's 61.6%. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. But the number of people, that labor, labor market churn, you think about where we were in February of 2020, that's gone from 777,000 to 942,000. So it's really interesting to see we've actually increased the number of people that have voluntarily left their jobs and have not acquired new ones. So that's really important to think about as we think about what's next. So I wanna share a quote with you. This comes from um, the uh, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He is a Democrat, but again, politics aside, my goal in sharing this quote with you, is not about politics. It's specifically that when we look at the data, everyone's going to interpret the data differently. So when the June jobs report came out the first week of July, everyone had a different take. Certain takes were skewed, right? Politically here in the US, we skew our narrative based on the party. But again, our jobs isn't necessarily to think that way. It's to look at what was the trend. When I went and looked at all the data and which party you know, was complaining about what, which leaders, which media pundits, one of the common themes was about this notion of labor market or labor force participation rate. If you haven't heard that term before, 
before. That is essentially the proportion of the working age population that is either working or actively looking for work. And so it's really important to think about that in context that many people across the board are saying, hey, look, it's great we've added all these jobs. However, this labor force participation rate has stayed static. And we need to think about what that actually means for us as talent acquisition leaders. Essentially, your candidate pools aren't growing. And for all of us who are actively hiring, right, if you've got a rec load in particular, that's a challenge. If you're trying to brand and market, the people you're branding and marketing to may be the same. So let's talk about what this actually means to you. So there's four things that are gonna be really important for you to think about this week. One, data out of context is dangerous, right? It's really great to throw numbers around. Your leaders may be doing that, but it's also really important to recognize you can't take it out of context. So if I'm in your shoes back when I was in house, prior to starting Exactio, I ran the global employer brand and marketing function for Marriott. I asked a lot of questions. So when my leaders started sharing data, I asked them, why do you think that's important? What about these other numbers? Make sure you get context, not just for yourself, but from them. We know that this low participation rate is gonna to continue to make hiring challenging, but I am a huge fan of qualitative data. We cannot rely solely on quantitative numbers. We have to unpack the data and really understand the why. So let's spend a minute and let's talk about why understanding this why is so essential. Well, there's a couple things to think about. First, the major outcomes from the past 18 months are all Maslowian. Let's not forget that no matter our job, work puts food on our table. It puts a roof over our head. If we have children or dependents, it may pay for that childcare. Basic life needs were taken away from people in the past 18 months. And even if they weren't taken away from you, it's really important to think around, uh, think about the circle you spend time in. The people you may be recruiting may not overlap entirely with your own community. And so what happens is we often rely on the data from the people around us or the experiences from the people around us. And that can be really challenging because they may not mimic the people that we're serving. Our health was incredibly impacted. I don't need to tell all of you that, both physical and mental health. But as recruiters, as talent acquisition leaders, as employer branders, are we thinking about where people physically and mentally are when we're talking to them. And then ultimately, what we found qualitatively is that this idea of how we better our lives has changed. So that notion of, a, of an American dream perhaps has changed. Do we still wanna climb that corporate ladder? Is it all worth it? These are all the questions we're asking ourselves. So how do we take that and translate that as you're going through this week, thinking about what this means to you? What data is really helpful to explain some of the trends we're seeing? First of all, I think when you look at the number of unemployment claims, that number is pretty staggering. 100 million people or 100 million unemployment claims have been filed. Sorry, not people. That's a really important number because just pause for a second. If you've never been out of a job, if you've never had to file for unemployment, you've got to try as hard as you can to have some empathy. How it must feel to go file for unemployment. A hundred million claims were filed. That alone qualitatively can give you some insight into who some of these people might be that you're interacting or that you're trying to reach and perhaps aren't even responding. Is diversity important to you? Look, for example, at the number of black women who are unemployed compared to the number of white women. That's the stat that came from the June jobs report. That's a staggering difference, that's 4%. So if during the past 18 months, your organization has made a commitment based on the social justice movement, think about that. Why are there so many more black women in particular who are unemployed? And what can we actually do? Um, exactly, I ran a global study, or sorry, a, a national study um, in April. And we found that 68% of people were committed or highly committed to their current employer. And I will say that number surprised us. And it was a large sample size of thousands of people. That number surprised us because I think we're all just assuming everyone is going to leave. But people are still committed for a number of reasons. And if we dig into that, think about that. If you had filed for unemployment, but now you're working again, you're pretty scared to potentially leave your job, especially with a potential second COVID wave. So it's really important to think, what does that mean? 
I take away, I like to take away really specific things um, that I can do. And so for you all, I'd say, okay, if I see that number, what does that mean to me as a talent acquisition leader? Or if I'm a recruiter, I should really, every candidate I talk to, I should be asking them, are they committed and to their current organization? And if so, what would actually make them change? What are they looking for in a new employer? The other, I think, really interesting statistic to understand right now, the media is just obsessed with this idea of working from home, working virtually. I actually never use the word work remote because remote means you're far away and disconnected. And we're actually not. We're all connected by technology today. So it's incredibly important to recognize only 29% of jobs, according to the BLS, can realistically be done in a virtual or work from home setting. So that leaves over 70% of jobs or people who aren't working from home or working virtually. And yet for some reason, that's all we seem to be talking about. That may be because our own communities, all of our friends and family may have jobs or the majority may have jobs that can work virtually. So it's really important to think about your audience. Are you recruiting and manufacturing in healthcare, frontline workers? Get yourself in that mindset of what does it mean to do a job that realistically you really cannot be working um, virtually. In the, the follow-up to the jobs report um, from June, um, Lawrence Katz, who's an economist, a well-respected economist at Harvard University, was quoted in the Wall Street Journal reflecting on this, finally qualitatively. Economists don't always um, comment on employment in the way that I like because they talk so much about the numbers and not about feelings. But I think um, Lawrence Katz really got it right. It is a mismatch of expectations and aspirations. And so as talent acquisition pros, we've got to really make sure we clearly understand for every candidate, what do they expect and what are they aspiring to do? So let's spend a minute talking about how. There's a couple things you need to consider of what this means for you. Your candidate interactions are going to require more pull. If you're on autopilot, if you're using a script, if you jump right into the job description, stop for a second. Maybe rethink your approach. Maybe it's more about talking about them first, asking them if they're committed or what their expectations are, what they're really looking for in an employer. The candidate data you're collecting also has to evolve to capture how employment expectations are changing. If the only candidate data that you're tracking is on SAT, or engagement on your career site, you're not truly getting a sense about how your candidate feels right now. So my take is that all of you are really gonna have to think about how to change gears based on the change in the employment relationship. So exactly has been doing a lot of research on this changing employment relationship. And there's a couple of things that we've learned. One, candidates and employees are completely rethinking their aspirations post pandemic. Even if they don't change, even if they're staying where they are and they're committed, they're still pausing and thinking, what is it that I really want? We know the social justice movement has made a change for companies in their commitment to diversity and inclusion, and that's great. But it also, on the candidate side, it is reinforcing a really important need for identity and belonging. What does it mean? How do I know if I thrive in an organization? Throw that word fit out immediately. Focus on asking people what will help you thrive here? What are you looking for to really feel like you belong in an organization? The more information you get from the candidate, this changing candidate, the more you can actually start to think about how you can change your own perspective. And quite honestly, it's no longer employee versus organization. I'm going to talk more about the changing employment relationship and how it's actually changed in just a few minutes. But we think about the employee as just evaluating the organization and am I happy here? And we don't think about what are the other things that are changing. There's been lots of studies, of course, done on COVID. This is one of my favorite quotes from the New York Times. Amid school closures caused by the pandemic, nearly 80% of mothers said they primarily managed homeschooling, although 45% of men believed that they actually did. It's funny, but it's also a challenge. We're all facing challenges at home. And I will tell you real time, I got a call two hours ago from my daughter's camp that she had a close contact COVID exposure. And so my husband and I were scrambling about an hour and a half ago to go pick her up and bring her home and plan for the week. And so while we're lucky in our family unit that we have a good plan and we know how we handle these things, a lot of families don't because they don't know how to handle these things or they can't, or they're struggling with 
just putting food on the table. So they can't put brain space to some of these things. So what we need to think about as talent acquisition pros is not just how do I fill my rack or reporting back that I had this many calls or this many leads, but starting to think about what am I learning about my candidates? That qual versus quant. Now, of course, our leaders care about the data. We know that. So how can you blend both qual and quant to really set your own career up for a success? Now is a really great time to expand your own thinking. How will this data affect your role? I won't go through all of these statistics, but these stats are really important and you'll all get a copy of this deck as well. Think about, we're actually seeing few high, fewer high school graduates go to college. We're seeing that um, there are fewer people with disabilities that are employed. How can you tap into some of these things? We think about some of the challenges that we're seeing across you know, different ethnicities. Self-employed Asians, more of them are now unemployed. How can you tap into some of these things and what do they mean for you? I live here in Charleston, South Carolina, and we are the number two city for inbound net migration, or the number two state, I should say, um, with Idaho being number one in the US post-COVID. What does that mean for you and your candidates and where they are and how likely they are to, to shift or move? So let's dig into that a little more as well and what this means to you. First, you've got to rethink sourcing in ways you've never done before. Stop and really ask yourself, what are the wild and crazy things you can do sourcing-wise? Start to think about psychology. How can you really focus on how candidates feel and completely tailor your response? How can you connect with a candidate? Not just are they interested in the job, but how are they feeling personally? And that's not just recruiters. You've got to train your hiring managers too to completely change gears based on the change in the employment relationship. So as we shift our conversation today, let's finish out with talking about how the employment relationship is changing. And what I wanna do first is spend a minute and talk about how the employment relationship has always been. If you look at HR academics, um, HR and academics, if you geek out on, on this stuff like I do, you'll see that employment has always been referred to as a contract, a me versus you, a quid pro quo. That goes back through the history of HR, rooted in everything from welfare secretaries to labor relations. But the idea is we've treated hiring as a transaction. We didn't invent applicant tracking systems to make it better for candidates. The applicant tracking system was invented to better track EEO and affirmative action plan data. So it was for us, right? So what's happened, unfortunately, is we've treated hiring as a transaction and we're so focused and we even talk about it as process. That's how it's always been. However, this is changing. As I said, um, our amazing team at Exactio has spent years researching the employment relationship and this was completely illuminated by COVID. So today, I'm actually going to give you a sneak peek at some early insight, and um, we'll be sharing an announcement in the next couple of weeks on our blog um, with a completely new way to look at the employment relationship and a look at employer brand. But let me share some of that data and research with you right now. Because employment has always been looked at as a contract, uh, we can't always talk about what's now or next without talking of this notion that it's usually just been this idea of me, the employee, and my organization. What we have found in our several year of research is this hiring as a transaction is now gone. The employment relationship is now not just based on our relationship with the organization, but four dimensions. What is my relationship with the organization? Do I trust them? And do they trust me? So how my organization responded, for example, during the past 18 months or so, how did that change my level of trust? That's language you can use with your candidates. Second dimension is, do I respect my leaders and do they respect me? So do I respect a decision my leaders make, even if I don't agree with it, because of them? We always talk about people leaving bosses rather than just leaving a job. That is where that relationship dimension comes into play. Third relationship dimension is my coworkers. Do I value them and do they value me? If I'm working on a manufacturing line, I have to value that the person ahead of me is going to do the job that they're supposed to do. And they have to value the work I do. And then finally, the relationship I have with my work. Do I care about my job and what I do every day? Even if I am bagging groceries, do I care about doing that right, that the eggs don't break for the customer? And do I firmly believe that the person or people on the receiving end of my work, even if I work you know, on building a plane and I've 
developed or, or designed a particular widget? Do I believe I'm keeping the, the people safe on the other end? And do they care about that? So when you look at the employment relationship, it's no longer a back and forth. It's no longer, what am I giving my organization? And what money are they paying me in return? What benefits, what table stakes am I getting? Instead, I now as an employee am looking at my relationship with my employment in these four ways. So it's a great, really easy way to talk to your candidates because you can ask, how are all four of these things delivering? It's not perfect, right? You're not gonna care equally about all four of these things. They're going to change as you, as you change, as your organization changes, and as, as you grow in your own job and career. And you can use this mindset with yourself as well. So as we move into this week, keep this mindset in mind. Think about how things have changed. We're not selling anymore. Please don't call recruiting any more selling. We're not selling. We're relationship building. If we were selling, we would be selling a product, right? Like my phone. We're not. We're building relationships. How do we build those relationships? And what can you learn this week in order to do that? I'm absolutely here to help. I'd love to talk to each and every one of you. So I'll pause here um, and turn it back to the team to open up for questions and certainly reach out if I can be helpful. Andrew, team, back to you. Andrew, I think you might be muted. Andrew, your mic is muted. You know, you would think by now you would know not to mute your <laughs> mic. We've had that now happen twice, and that's okay because it's not flawless and it's not perfect. And I wish it was, but um, Susan, I do I do appreciate uh, all the statistics you were putting out. Lots of people were asking questions about how do I get this data? Where do I get this presentation? So I know there's going to be a lot of sharing. There was a couple of questions that did pop up outside of where do I get this information? So, and I thought the first one was kind of uh, interesting, which was. If 61% of people are are looking, what are the other what are the other folks doing? Are they are they leaning in? Are they engaging? Are they being promoted? What kind of information do you have on the other the people who aren't looking? This is where the qualitative data matters so much, and this is, we're not going to get this from employee sat, employee engagement. The majority of us don't collect this data, and but we do at Exactly because we do market research. So what we're seeing is a couple of things. One, people are committed just out of Maslowian security, right? I'm I'm in a good situation. I'm managing things at home, okay, or with my own personal life, and so I'm going to stay where I am. I'm committed. Other people are scared of change, so they're looking at what's happening, right? Maybe seeing the second wave of COVID and saying you know, I'm not really sure now is the time to make a change. Still others have had to pull out completely, right? So we know all of the, the sort of statistics around the she session and women leaving the workplace, um, but there's a lot of men that are leaving the workplace too. And I think for some of them, it's either holding tight or they just don't have a choice. And so that's part of it. I would caution you to not just look at the broad numbers, the broad feedback, do research and data with your own employee or target candidate populations. And I'm always happy to chat more about how to do that one-on-one um, -on -one with folks. Well, one of the questions is, is um, where do we start with getting this data? So if you had a couple of good points that, hey, if you wanted to get good qualitative data from candidates, yeah. you know, what are two or three things that people can do right away? First is budget. Data from candidates is expensive. And here's why. When we think about the budgets that our colleagues spend on the marketing side to get market research data, that those budgets, those pockets are deep. And yet we don't do that on the employment side, right? We focus on our own employees. Maybe we throw a survey up on our career site. So you've got to make the case to get some data. You've got to show that qualitative data is really important. Once you get data, you've, I mean, once you have budget, you've got to determine, am I going to do this on my own or am I going to find a partner? And there's lots of ways you can do both. Certainly you can do it on your own or you can find a partner. Benefit from a partner is that they have that experience, right? And they can help you think through how to do it. Benefit on your own, of course, is cost. And you can do that through survey. You can also do it through focus groups. The important thing is to make sure you're prepared to do the survey or the focus groups and ask the right questions. The last thing that's so important is to make sure that you're also um, incenting people. 
If you want, you have to have a budget for incentives, whether you're doing it yourself or um, you're hiring a partner to do it, you've got to have incentives to pay people. That's how you're going to get the most valuable data. And that's how market researchers do it and get really good data on what should we do next, right? About the about my phone. What What's the latest or the greatest change that we should make? Awesome. One more, uh, and then we got to get over to Meta McKinney. Um, there was some questions about uh, from uh, from people in hospitality, and mm -hmm. they're just having trouble getting applications. They're just not seeing it come in. So, any advice as a as the next leader in the space on what you can do to get them if they're not applying, coming to your website? Yeah, after spending, it's it's a good question. My heart breaks for the hospitality industry right now because they got hit so hard by COVID, and now they're seeing that. I live in one of the number one tourist destinations in the country, so we're seeing it really here hard here in Charleston, restaurants are not opening or, or cutting shifts or not serving certain meals because they can't find people. So advice would be three things. One would be really start making the case about hospitality as a career. What does it mean? Um, and how can people really see the value? You're not going to find um, talent in your normal channels. Second is making sure you have data to see how are people being treated. Hospitality is well known is pretty challenging. The kitchen culture can be really tough. Same with the server culture. So you've got to get a real sense. Do we know how that is? And then last but not least, get boots on ground. While we still can be out and about, you know, in case there's another wave, get out there in your local community. You cannot do this behind a computer. Hospitality talent is not always online. Even if they're on their mobile devices, you've got to get face-to-face -face and use your people in your local communities to do that. Awesome. Susan, always good seeing you. Uh, it's been too long. You and I need to catch up. I know that we've got more questions in the chat, uh, more questions mm -hmm. in the Q and A. Uh, so if you wanted to pop in there and maybe make some responses sure. or catch some people on the networking sessions, that'd be great. Uh, we're going to close this one up and we're going to go over to Meta and learn a little bit about talent intelligence. But again, always good seeing you. Thank you for your contribution and uh, and your presentation today. Thank you all so much. I hope everybody has a great week. Please give yourself the time to enjoy these sessions if you can. Please reach out to me at susanbigzaglio.com and I will hop over in the chat right now and try to get the rest of those questions. Thanks everybody. Thanks all.